I would just like to welcome everyone tonight to the very first Culver City Historical Society virtual Zoom program. Yay. <laughs> yeah. We have quite a full room, very exciting. Um, I think I'm gonna open up this room now to Claire Dank and her and uh, Eric Sims to present their program on the history of the Culver Theater. And I hope you all enjoy. Uh, I found a lot on a website called newspapers.com, which is actually pretty comprehensive. It has newspapers from across the country. Let's dive into some history. I'm gonna backtrack just for a second to give you an idea of the other theaters we had in Culver City. Culver Theater, oh, and by the way, the Red Stallion refers to the opening film at, at the Culver Theater. So here's the first theater um, in 1915, um, which I guess existed even before this, the city did, and it eventually shared space with City Hall. You'll see City Hall in this image here. And then by the end of this theater's run, um, two women started the Meralta Theater. Oh, and I should mention this theater um, was replaced by the Culver Hotel. This is where the Culver Hotel now stands. So then two women, former vaudevillians, they opened the Meralta Theater, which had an incredibly long run in Culver City. Um, and during its run, there was a fire in 1943 and it temporarily had to move here. We had our second Culver City Theater um, a more informal one because it was a uh, sharing space in this case with the, I believe the third city hall that we had. And it was around for quite a while because uh, in 1945, the Meralta Theater moved back into its original location. Um, and this one though, kept going even through the opening of the Culver Theater. Oh, and if you're curious where the Meralta Theater was, um, that's where the Meralta Office Plaza is, um, ironically, next to the fire station, so. <laughs> and here's just a couple of ads. I have a feeling people here probably are least likely to know about this Culver City Theater because it was so temporary and it was in, the, in City Hall, so. That's just a little background. And also there was the Palms Theater. I didn't include that because technically it was not part of Culver City, but of course it was, it was nearby. Okay, so now I'm going to dive into the Culver Theater and I'm sure you're wondering why is this the Culver Theater? It says principal um, in this rendering here. Apparently there was a company called the Principal Theaters Incorporated and they originally were going to put their name on the theater. And they had already invested money in the Meralta and the Culver City Theater in the past. So this was just a rendering early on. I don't think they really had broken ground at this point, but they said it was going to cost half a million dollars to build. And it was originally going to open in October of 1946. And in this article, it touted Beauty as well as comfort is being taken into consideration in the construction of the Mammoth Film House. And keep in mind, like this, this was a big deal for Culver City. Like this was as close to a movie palace as they were they were going to get. It had more seating, more cutting edge technology. So it was an exciting moment for the city. And then here we're in 1947 at this point, they're gonna say, saying it's gonna open in April. As you know, with most construction projects, they keep pushing the date back. It's funny though, in this, in this clipping, they said it would cost only $200,000 to, to build. Um, the cost keeps fluctuating as you look through all of this. This is the best clipping I found, um, really in depth. And this is just a few months before it ultimately opened August 13th. So I think these are pretty accurate descriptions of what they were doing. I know this is, you can't read the clipping, so I'm going to quote a few passages for you. Um, quote, it's 303 modern up-to-date wonders. That's 303. I guess some poor person counted that. Uh, it's 303 modern up-to-date wonders include an all-steel frame, television tower, orthoscope projection, 
germ-proofed air, very timely, uh, full view seating, no glare lighting, no draft ventilation, curtains of spun glass. I didn't know that was a real thing. Um, symphonic sound, earthquake proof, fireproof, plastic light coves, transfox sound control, all glass front doors, galbestos roof, which I think is asbestos encased in metal, but anyway, a galbestos roof, and two ramps leading into the auditorium. Um, you might have been afraid I was going to say 303 things. I, I'm not, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> but anyway, as you can see, they really were investing a lot in, the, in this and wanted it to be the most up-to-date, cutting-edge theater. So uh, it went on to say, and I'll jump to this beautiful image of what the auditorium looked like at the time. It went on to say, with old rose predominating, a soft all hand-painted rainbow color effect is evidenced in the drop leaf ceiling and walls in both the main auditorium and lobby. So if you all kind of see where my cursor is here, um, see this kind of scroll work around the, the curtain here. Well, recently, we were uh, lucky enough to get to see part of this in living color. Um, Carolyn McDemus was nice enough to donate this to the Historical Society just recently. And her son, um, several years ago in the 1990s, salvaged it and uh, kept it in his art studio for many years. Um, and he, he sadly passed away, I believe, in 2012. Um, but Carolyn McDemus was nice enough to donate it to us. It's just really exciting to see it in color. And I just want to share you just a little bit about like how this was made, just like two sentences. Um, apparently, there was this huge Fox Culver City warehouse, because this was part of the Fox West Coast theater chain. And they did, everything was handmade in-house. And they said, um, painted aluminum panels are used around the proscenium as well as over the forward exits. Craftsmen at Fox's Culver City warehouse used stencils and paint to create these panels. Another application of this style used steel wool and an acid solution to hand prepare these types of ornamentation. So this was a really involved process. Um, just to go back here a second, um, it went on to explain how like more brass lighting fixtures and decorative painting gray sidewalls. And then here, if you look where my cursor is, it said a painted wainscoting on the sides gives the illusion of three-dimensional tufting. So that was all just kind of a look. It looked like it was tufting there. I thought that was pretty neat. And I was just quoting now from a, a booklet called Scro Size for Showmanship. It's referencing um, the architectural style, which I'm, I'm going to get more into for in a second here. And then here is this beautiful photograph. Um, this actually came from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. They have the Tom Ben and Kaufman collection and it's a great, great um, uh, archive covering movie theaters um, from across the country. Um, but anyway, as you look at this beautiful image here, I'll, I'm gonna quote from that clipping again. It said, um, they would have a $6,000 confection counter, which will be installed in the foyer with the freshest and candy nuts and confections. And it also mentioned carpeting deep and rich is a blue and solid, blue and I believe gold coloring. So you have to kind of just visualize all of that. And then they uh, finally mentioned parking, which obviously still today is a headache for all of us in LA. But back then it sounded pretty great. They said, uh, all you have to do is drive your car in front of the theater and an attendant will pick it up and park it at the Metro Super parking lot, one block west where accommodations for 600 automobiles are available. Um, that just sounded pretty fabulous. So they really thought of everything for this, this theater. Now, Scuro style, what is that? 
I did not know what this was till I started researching it. It it's, refers to an architectural style specifically for Fox West Coast theaters, which the Culver Theater was part of. And it was kind of an overtop style um, credited to Charles P. Scrooge. He owned the Fox West Coast theater chain. And he really wanted more of a throwback to the 20s movie palaces, um, kind of a neo Baroque style. Um, the definition in that booklet I was reading from earlier, they say, showmanship and architecture, sweeping scroll work, deep hanging festoon drapes, multicolored neon lit coves, generous use of gold leaf and lighting fixtures of brass and aluminum. And this was really going against the style of the time because after the war they were starting to streamline things and have less ornamentation. Um, but Charles B. Scrooge really wanted to, to make it an experience still. Um, and his brother, by the way, was president of, of Fox Studios. And the in-house warehouse, I kind of mentioned that already. And Albert R. Walker was the architect and Carl G. Muller was the design consultant for this theater. Now, honestly, one of the main reasons I chose this ad was because um, it's just, you have a martini larger than the people. Um, but <laughs> besides that, there is a reason I chose this. Um, on the right, there's a brief mention of testing out the lights on the front of the new building. Quote, um, Roy McGurk butcher at the City Mart had to wear dark glasses so he could be sure his thumb was resting on the scales. Seriously, though, the marquee is going to be one of the most colorful in Southern California. It should be a top-notch drawing card for Culver City. Um, I love how they used to have these kind of jokey blurbs in newspapers like that. Um, anyway, I wanted to share that. This, I was very excited to find. Uh, Louis B. Mayer visited the theater. And keep in mind, this was a Fox theater, but Louis B. Mayer was head of MGM, a competing studio. But then again, he, his studio was just two blocks uh, from the theater. So he did live nearby and he did visit it. It's very exciting to see evidence of that. So I just wanted to share that. This is the first clipping where I saw a date set for the theater. Um, as I go through a few of these, you'll notice sometimes it seems to, it's open to August 14th instead of 13th. Um, the clippings seem to conflict with each other. Maybe people afterwards can discuss, um, but I'm gonna stick with it being August 13th as the opening. And uh, it was gonna be stadium seating, which um, as you saw in the picture, which is really what we still have today in a lot of movie theaters. Here's an ad from the Daily News. Um, this is from August 12th. And if you look at the bottom of this ad, it says grand opening new Culver City Theater Wednesday on stage, Eddie Dean, Roscoe Waits in person. And they were gonna show Red Stallion. And you know, is another odd thing is Eddie Dean and Roscoe Waits, I don't think they were in Red Stallion. So I'm not sure why. <laughs> They were Western stars, but I'm not sure why they were making a personal appearance for this film, unless maybe they were uncredited. I don't know. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, new theater opening to crowds. Uh, I'll just quote from this. More than a thousand persons, including film stars, civic notables, city officials, and theater-minded citizens will attend tonight's grand opening of the Culver Theater. I just threw this in because the illustration was fun. Um, this, the, here they talk about the matinee show for the kids. From what I can tell, there was a matinee first and then a more splashier opening the same evening. I think they were supposed to be the same day, but anyway. And here's a great description of what opening night was like. Uh, it's very dramatic, uh, quote, sky piercing searchlights a veritable garden of flowers and a general premiere atmosphere greeted thousands who attended last night's grand opening of the Culver Theater. Uh, it goes on to say, greeting first nighters in the foyer were manager Ted Morris and assistant manager Ed Burke, together with a bevy of usherettes clad in floor length formals. Following the showing of the film, a general open house was held in the foyer where friends exchanged greetings and commended the beauty of the new film palace. 
And I wish I had a picture of those usherettes. Um, I couldn't find any, but I got this quote, um, thanks to Julie Vugosera. Uh, the theater manager in full tuxedo supervised ushers in white shirts, bow ties, red jackets, and gray pants with a silver stripe down the side. Um, I don't know if there were ushers and usherettes or what that's all about, but um, anyway, you can kind of visualize what the, the uniform was, what, what it looked like. Um, I just threw this in here because it's just a kind of a funny reporting of all the kids. Apparently there were 2,800 kids opening day, which would have been impossible because it only seated uh, about 1,150, but uh, it's just fun. And then I'm going to just dive into some beautiful photographs. Many thanks to Mark Wanamaker and his Bison Archives. Thank you, Mark. It's just beautiful. Um, you can see this one says grand opening soon, so probably a few days before August 13th. Here's a shot. This would be if you were standing in the Chase parking lot today and looking across. Um, at the time, it looks like there was a 76 gas station there. Here's a beautifully framed shot where um, this would be if you were driving down Hughes, sea salt would be on the right here today. Um, there's the theater. Here's the gorgeous powder room. Um, I think Hope Parrish told me this wallpaper was still around at least in the 60s. And then these beautiful lighting fixtures, which you can miss, but they're beautiful too. The chandelier. This is a cool shot looking out, very unusual. And I think it might have been taken in conjunction with this other shot. Now, Eric, myself, and Hope had a really exciting discovery. Um, well, Hope really pointed it out. When we were doing a rehearsal of this, I mean, I already thought this didn't fit into the other pictures I saw. I thought this is garish and messy and weird. It doesn't make sense. And Hope, who has been a prop master, she said, you know what? I think this is set dressing for a movie. These are props and set, I was like, oh. And I, I had already chosen a clip from a film noir called Tension, which was filmed the same year this photograph was taken. So I'm not even sure Mark Wanamaker knows the history of this photograph, but we think it's actually set dressing for the movie Tension, which is very exciting. So, um, though I'm ultimately glad they didn't keep all of this here. It's a lot going on. So with that, I am going to briefly unshare my screen because um, the clip doesn't play loudly enough my computer. Mark Morris, who was nice enough to edit this clip, we're going to play a clip from Tension. Um, it features Barry Sullivan and William, William Conrad interviewing the theater manager in the lobby of the Culver Theater. And at the end of the clip, we'll just have a brief bonus Culver City location you might recognize. This is an MGM film shot in a Fox, Fox theater. And don't forget to look over the actor's shoulder. Just as they're leaving the lobby, you'll see all those props again. She ever been in this theater? Sure, I've seen her. You know her name? Her name? Mm -hmm. How would I know? A lot of people come in here. How about him? Yeah, that's the guy she comes in here with sometimes. A big, flashly dressed fellow. Drives one of these new fancy convertibles. Uh -huh. Sort of a green, uh, no, it's black. They uh, come in here often? Well, I think so. Saturday I... night? The girl, that is. Can you remember if the girl was in here Saturday night? Well, let me think. I uh, Saturday night. Huh. Saturday night? Yeah. That's our giveaway night. Bicycle, dishes, footballs. I really don't remember, fellas. So many uh, people right. come Thanks in that I... Much. How about some of that popcorn, huh? Thanks. That's all right. Thanks. Hey, Mr. Quimby. 
It's a beautiful day out. That, that movie's hard to find, by the way. You pretty much have to catch on TCM or get on, on, on DVD. But it's, it's a good film noir if you like film noir. So just here's, here's an ad soon after the theater opened. I thought I'd throw this in here per chance some local in Culver City remembers Leo Walser or is Leo Walser. Um, he was a newsboy and I guess he was the first ticket buyer um, at the Culver Theater. Now, less than 10 days after the theater opened, crime had descended on the theater. Um, this guy, Ted Wilhelm Wells, had stolen loudspeakers worth $1,000 from the theater. And he was booked and put in Culver City Jail. And I believe it went to the Los Angeles Superior Court, which seems a bit much. But also funny in this article is it mentions the theater costs $750,000 to build, which is the highest amount um, I'd seen. So who knows? But a few months later, so the, the guy was Ted Wilhelm Wells, right? So I noticed wow. this, this is Ted Wells. Um, I thought it was really funny because he looks a lot like William Conrad in the clip we just saw. <laughs> so I had to share it for that reason and just the Garish shirt and the irony because this apparently a few months later, Ted Wells um, experienced some pranks himself. Uh, he owned a store. So I don't know, someone might want to want to research him. He sounded like an interesting character. But anyway, that was about the extent of crime in the Culver Theater. Um, programming I want to just oh does someone say something yeah Claire uh if you could repeat the name of the kid who bought the first ticket please yes that was let me be sure I get right Leo Walzer thank you mm -hmm. <clears throat> so even though the Culver Theater was part of Fox West Coast theaters it seems from the beginning they showed films that weren't exclusively Fox films, um, which struck me as unusual because um, at that time, studios owned theater changed. Um, and this was before the Paramount decrees in 1948 in which studios had to give up their theater chains. Um, so it's interesting they were already showing different films, not just Fox films. But I also want to show it to you because I'm sure you recognize and would appreciate just the, the font of the Culver down here. But mostly they showed, uh, I would say, B films, kid shows, sneak previews, which unfortunately in the papers, all it ever says is sneak preview. So I never know what they ultimately <laughs> were secretly showing there. And, um, but it was definitely more of a family run kind of theater with lots of Westerns. Like for example, yeah, here, the, the first anniversary, I mean, they're showing the dude goes West. So, not exactly A-list material, but you know, family friendly. And they were showing a Superman serial. And then four years later, it's already reopening. What? Um, I guess it was at that point it was under it was under new management. Um, Fred Smith was the new theater manager, and uh, he wanted a brand new family family policy. So it already seemed family oriented, but also um, in this clipping, it mentions an air conditioning system, uh, the latest type of projection and sound equipment. And when it reopened, the kids uh, could see Alice in Wonderland. And for the adults, they had People Will Talk starring Cary Grant. I threw this in because um, if you just look at the top of this ad, they were offering a free car. Um, I've heard of free dish nights at movie theaters, uh, especially during the depression, but a uh, car really seemed unusual to me. So, and of course the film titles are kind of fun here. And it seems by 1954, they definitely had the technology to show a film in CinemaScope. Um, the robe was so popular, they held it over, it seems for quite a few days. Um, when the King and I played at the Culver Theater, Joyce Liu, a child star, made an appearance. Um, she was in the King and I, uh, at least in the death <clears throat> in the death scene near the end. She made an appearance, and she was also a local. She lived in Culver City, so she Joyce Liu might still be alive, or maybe she's in the audience tonight. I don't know, but she, she was a local. 
There's just more cute ads for kids shows. Now, I just want to take a moment with Frank Ramsey, okay? Um, I call him Mr. Showman. He was theater manager for the Culver Theater from 1953 to 1960. He was an usher as a kid. He uh, put on live shows for the troops during World War II. And so he was very, he was kind of a flashy, fun guy. And I found the most interesting things happened during his, his tenure. And to just give you an idea of the type of guy he was, um, apparently at a press club event, um, Jane Mansfield, they said, um, will be delivered to the club in a burlap bag carried by Santa Claus, played by Frank Ramsey, manager of the Fox Culver Theater. Um, so you already get an idea that what kind of guy <laughs> this was, he was. Um, he even wanted to produce his own films at one point. I don't think he did, but he's definitely worthwhile researching. He's an interesting person. But when he was managing the theater, they showed a Western called The Restless Breed. And as part of that, Frank Ramsey decided to put on a fast gun draw contest. Uh, apparently in this clipping, it says, the contest will be open to anyone between the ages of six and 60, regardless of sex. Um, quote, let's see, Frank Ramsey then near the end here said, don't forget to get your shooting irons oiled up and raring to go so that we can find out who is the fastest gun draw in Culver City. So obviously this is something that would not happen today. Um, I, I, I also try to figure out, did they just like draw their gun or actually shoot their gun? Was this in the seat theater, in front of the theater? I don't know. I thought it was really um, kind of, it, it was funny. Then in 1958, there was an Elvis protest in front of the theater. Um, Frank Ramsey was showing a film called Sing Boy Sing, starring Tommy Sands, who was a boy singer at the time. And uh, two months earlier in March, 1958, Elvis had gone into the army. So I think a lot of teenagers didn't like the idea of other singers taking Elvis's place on the big screen. So apparently they had a picket line out front and uh, let's see, Ramsey reported 60 phone calls from unidentified girls who kept shou shouting, Elvis is king, we want Elvis. But Elvis, uh, I'm sorry, but Ramsey did not give in and he, he showed the Tommy Sands film. But here's a, I'm sorry I couldn't get a great image of the, the teenagers here. But here's the, the poster, Sands will fade, Elvis is king. And uh, they're kind of right. Um, way more people remember Elvis today than Tommy Sands, so. And because the Oscars just happened, I thought I'd just mention this. Um, for a few years, the Culver Theater and the Palms Theater had a, a sweepstakes where you would fill out a ballot and guess who who were the, going to be the winners that year for the Oscars, and then you could win a prize. And the prizes are pretty great. If you, if you won first prize, you would get a gold engraved pass for two to all Culver and Palms theaters for one year, plus a Hollywood studio tour, dinner, and pictures with a star, uh, which sounds pretty great. Even the second and third prize included the tour and dinner with the star. Um, I do wonder if these were really A-list stars. I don't know. But uh, I thought that was, that was a fun idea. And just briefly, there were a lot of business tie-ins over the years. This one was um, sponsored by La Bayona Savings and Loan Association. They did a free, free holiday show for the kids. Um, there were a lot of those through the years. And then I don't have a clipping for this. Um, but according to Julie Lugo Serra, who is our city historian, um, she knew someone who worked in the studios and, and apparently there was Elvis arranged a private screening of Viva Las Vegas so he could watch it with Anne Margaret. We don't have any hard evidence that, that it's just a rumor, but um, if you want to imagine maybe there was Elvis was Elvis was in the house at a certain point in the Culver Theater. Now, um, this should kind of wake you up and shock you, right? Um, 
I put this in here to show you how programming was changing by the 60s uh, or films. Um, one way to get people out of the house was to provide shock value at movie theaters. Um, this obviously probably would not be something you would see on TV in 1965, but censorship was loosening at the movie theaters. Um, so this was just one example of how the programming was changing. And uh, William Castle, by the way, was best known for House on Haunted Hill. This seemed to be the last big event that the Culver had. Um, it was a film festival and it was celebrating the 50th anniversary of the city. And in conjunction with that, they showed a lot of MGM films. And again, this irony of it being a Fox theater, but then the MGM connection. Um, so the, I don't think any big stars made an appearance from MGM, but um, this is the last big event that I know of that happened. Um, I wanna wrap up my talk so Eric can get to his presentation, but um, just here's a summary of the theater managers through the years. I kind of pieced it together as I, went through different clippings. Um, you can see by the 60s how the changeover, it, it was changing over a lot more often. Theaters were struggling by this time. Here's a shot in 1969. And then colors really changed by the 70s. Um, this shot's from 1977. Um, the year beforehand, I think 76, Man Theaters bought the Culver Theater and split it into a triplex. So there, there were three theaters inside. It wasn't as glamorous anymore. 1983, though I've heard during the day that by this time it didn't look that great, but at night it still could pull it off. 1985, things are looking pretty dire. Um, in 1985, the theater was condemned. 1989, it closed. And then here's a shot. This would have been one year after the Northridge earthquake in uh, 94. And then at that point, they actually had to gut out the insides of the theater because the damage was so, so severe. And it had already been, already had been languishing. So um, just here again, some of the resources I use. This is just an informal listing of sorts, but mostly newspapers.com. Some of the additional photos and information I got a lot from Los Angeles Theaters blogspot.com, but take that with a grain of salt. Not everything on there is uh, accurate. And then thanks again to Mark Wanamaker for so many wonderful photographs. And if you want to know more about scro sized architecture, um, Check out this booklet that I was quoting from. Um, you can still find them online. It was, it was published by the Theater Historical Society of America in 1987. So it's a lot fun to go through. And I wanna introduce Eric Sims. He is Associate General Manager of Center Theater Group. And he's going to talk about the theater's second life as, as the Kirk Douglas Theater and how that came about and what they're doing now. Eric? Thank you, Claire. That was fantastic. How did the Culver Theater transform itself to the Kirk Douglas Theater? Well, I like to start the story with Gordon Davidson and Gordon was our founding artistic director. And he was the artistic director uh, from 1967 to 2004 and he was hired as a young director from Brooklyn by Dorothy Chandler, or Buffy to her close friends, uh, to lead the Mark Taper Forum, which was at the heart of the brand new music center complex. So the Taper opened in 1967 with the movie, with the play, The Devils, uh, starring Frank Langella. This was a star-studded night. Uh, Governor Ronald Reagan was there and he spoke before the play and he called the Taper a beautiful temple to our art and profession. Now, The Devils tells the story of a libertine priest in the 17th century and the sexually repressed nun who opposed him. So I'm gonna read a bit from Gordon Davidson's unpublished autobiography, and this should tell you what Center Theater Group is founded on. And I apologize in advance for some of the language in here. Ed Flanders, playing the sewer man, came up out of the hole, 
through a bucket of slop without watching where it was going, and some of it hit Langella's robes. He tried to apologize, and when the vicar said it doesn't matter, the sewer man, in some of the first words ever spoken on the Mark Taper Forum stage, said, quote, it's wrong, though. Shit on the holy purple. So, Ronald Reagan gave the opening remarks, and Ronald Reagan walked out of the devils never to return to the taper again, along with many others. And that is the legacy of Gordon Davidson, uh, who ultimately did win two Pulitzer Prizes for Angels in America and the Kentucky Cycle. So from the beginning, Gordon wasn't satisfied with the taper. As bold as he was, he wanted another space. Because, you know, at a regional theater, you can only do so many shows a year. And he wanted a space where he could do new and adventurous work by diverse young playwrights. From the very beginning, he had a festival called the New Theater for Now Festival. I love things called New Theater for Now from 50 years ago. Uh, it's always now sometime. Uh, and this was, uh, he was then produced all over LA, Produ even at the Ivy substation, uh, Gordon was producing plays. He had a, a series of theater labs, which were led by playwrights uh, from different communities of color, mostly, developing work constantly. But the problem was there was nowhere for us to put that work for years. So finally, in the 90s, after Gordon's negotiations with the uh, Bergamots with Santa Monica for a space in Bergamot Station fell apart, Gordon started wondering about this boarded up theater he kept driving by in Culver City. And so he made a phone call to the redevelopment agency. And sure enough, in 1997, he entered into negotiations with the redevelopment agency for the Culver Theater. Now, I don't know how many of you work in nonprofit. But convincing your board to take on the rebuild of a basically ravaged movie theater is not an easy thing to do. And the way Gordon famously sold this to them, uh, there was a board meeting where they voted to approve it. And his associate, Robert Egan, who is a tremendous uh, developer of plays in his own right, spoke to the board and he read a list of seasons that never were. It was all these plays that Center Theater Group had developed had put our heart and soul in, but we couldn't find a space for them. There just wasn't room at the taper. And the board heard this and realized that how important it was for us to have another space to be able to produce this work. And so they voted to approve the Douglas. And you know, we can look back now at over 100 plays and events that we've had at the Douglas in 17 years and realize just how true it was that CTG needed this space to find a home for all of this work. Of course, what really made it possible was Kirk and Ann Douglas. They made the lead gift in 2002 of two and a half million dollars. And that is what it costs to have in 2002 to get a theater named after you. I should say that's five times what the original cost was in 1947. And the whole building would cost about eight and a half million dollars, which is now considered cheap by new theater standards. Uh, incidentally, $500,000 is what it costs us to produce a really big play at the Douglas right now. In case you're wondering how far your money stretches these days. Uh, it's also what it costs to rent an apartment, I think, in Culver City. Uh, this donation, so they made this donation, and in combination with major support from the Redevelopment Agency and from Wells Fargo and from other donors like Michael Douglas, uh, who little Pisher gave some money after his dad did, uh, they, he was able to bring the vision of Gordon Davidson's vision of the Culver Theater as the Kirk Douglas Theater to fruition. And so the theater opened in 2004. There it is. Uh, and Kirk Douglas said the first words ever spoken on the uh, Douglas stage. He did not say anything about shit on the holy purple, fortunately. Uh, he gave the theater a blessing for the house. Kirk Douglas loved speaking from the stage. It was actually a condition of his donation that he be permitted to say the first words from the stage. So when he, sp he told this joke, I think a thousand times that I heard, which was that he always wanted to be a star of the stage, even though he was a big movie star. And he would say words to the effect of, I finally figured out how to get myself on stage. You build your own theater. He loved that joke. Uh, so the exterior, as you can see, was preserved in a way that really honors the original spirit of the building. Uh, and, you know, except for the, the Culver sign, which of course was replaced by Kirk Douglas Theater sign, and the marquee, which was refashioned to allow for these sort of contemporary panels, it is very much a restoration on the exterior. Uh, however, our architect, Stephen Ehrlich, were always calls the theater a building inside a building. Well, what does it mean to be a building inside a building? Well, it was an exterior restoration. But as Claire said, the interior was gutted. 
And I wasn't there when this happened, but my friends who were there say they, the first time they walked in, there were holes in the roof and pigeons flying around. It was terrifying. So this is what they started from. And they built a new theater inside an old theater. And what's so cool about this is that they found room inside this space basically to create a whole new building which could accommodate everything you need for a live theater, which when you think about it is a lot more complicated because you have to have dressing rooms for all these human beings to change their clothes in and complain to you about. You've got to have a rehearsal room. You've got to have a lobby space that is larger. And most importantly, you need a stage. You need a place for people to perform. So they basically created a contemporary space for contemporary work. And I think this honors the spirit of the original Culver Theater, which was all opened as a cutting edge theater to be able to really accommodate the best of new work at the time. So there's 317 seats, 285 in the main floor. That's the original auditorium. And this is where we are. This is actually where we were in 2004, but it's still the best picture of the seats. They still look the same. Uh, fun fact about these seats. These seats are actually almost as old as the theater itself. These seats are not from the Culver Theater. They're from the Schubert Theater which was in Century City. And when the Schubert Theater was demolished, we took their seats. Well, we you know, acquired their seats. Uh, I don't think this was done out of benevolence. I think this was done out of thrift. But nevertheless, we acquired their seats. Now I should say, while it's wonderful to have these historical seats, there are not parts for these anywhere. So when every, every time actors come into the building, every time technicians come into the building, my speech to them is always, these seats are as old as the building. Use them only to sit on. And whenever I say this, three people at least stop standing on the seat or squatting on the seat and just sit on it like normal human beings. The cool thing about the Douglas that makes it unique as a performance venue is that it has this end stage configuration. So this is what it looks like in its bare state. You'll notice what the Douglas does not have is a stage. There is no raised stage. There is no physical structure here. There is only the floor. And that's done, basically, I call it a black box with a proscenium in front of it which is really smart if you know anything about theater for me to say that. And uh, what that means is we can configure that stage area to accommodate pretty much any kind of set or show that we want. So for instance, for Die, Mommy, Die, which was hysterical by the way, we had this very large naturalistic apartment set on kind of a broad stage raised up. And if you look carefully, you'll see we had sneaky audience seating on both sides. On the other hand, for Clay, several years earlier, this, is a, this was an edgy hip hop one man show. So we created this raised stage in the middle of the playing area with backlights and graffiti projection behind it to really give the sense of almost an actor in a boxing ring fighting for his life. And of course, what we can also do is not have any stage at all and just fill the theater with boxes. So this was for the object lesson in 2015. We pulled out the first five, what we, some lovely carpenters who are better at this stuff than I am pulled out the uh, first five rows of seats and put in this enormous uh, show filled with mostly cardboard boxes. Now they did this while I was on vacation. I knew about it. When I came back, it was like, okay guys, come on, put the seats back. This is very funny. Where's the theater? No, this was done on purpose. Uh, my favorite fun fact about this is that we had to flame proof every single Fakakta cardboard box. So it could be safe for stage use. We flame proofed 4,000 cardboard boxes. If you're wondering why theater is so expensive, now you know. The lobby, which uh, this is a great picture. I, I realized I was obsessed with how to figure out how old, when this picture was from. And finally, I Googled the stars. It's from about 1960. This was the, the old lobby. The lobby was reimagined as a social space for engagement and conversation. The interesting thing about the lobby is you'll notice it has that slanted shape because it's under the risers. And that shape was the one thing you couldn't get around. There's a beam that supports the risers that has to go there. So that shape is actually built into the space. It's one of the few things we couldn't sort of re-engineer. The cool thing about the lobby is it holds the full size of the audience. So it is a great space for us to do events. It's a great space for us to host a bar. We even do our own opening night receptions in the lobby. And we have a rehearsal room, which is kind of where the old projection booth used to be. And it's a great space for readings, events, and even the occasional rehearsal. So there is the, and so now, even though this was Gordon Davidson's lifelong dream to open the Douglas, things in life are funny. Uh, and a year after he opened the theater, he retired. And Michael Ritchie, our current artistic director, took over. 
even more momentum. In 2008, I began work. I, I was working in the marketing department. I was moved over as director of theater operations to the Kirk Douglas Theater. Now, I should say that Claire had that wonderful timeline of theater managers. I outlasted all of them. Uh, and also, um, I never wore a tuxedo to work. I own a tuxedo. I never wore it to work. And I did dress as Santa Claus once, but I did not have a woman in a burlap sack. Because in the 2010s, that is not something you do. So I did not abduct a starlet to take her to a club. So one of the things that I really focused on in my time at the Douglas, by the way, I'm still with Center Theater Group. I've just been promoted. I still do a lot with the Douglas. One of the things that I focused on was audience engagement. And, you know, I say this in the spirit of Frank Ramsey. I did not know who Frank Ramsey was until we rehearsed this a week ago. But it's so funny to hear how things change and remain the same. So we did what he was calling promotions. We called audience engagement. And our goal was really to deepen the experience of audience members coming to the theater, to give them something more than the show and to kind of enrich their understanding of the work in a way that is fun and playful. So this photo was taken for a play we did called Women Laughing Alone with Salad. This is one of the few plays in the American theater ever based on a meme. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a very popular meme of women who are eating salad and laughing hysterically for no good reason. If you, once I say this, you'll notice this in almost every like commercial for health products. So a woman wrote a play about it and we in the lobby created these giant oversized prop salad, set up a green screen and you could take a picture laughing alone with a salad of your choice. This is one of those times where the engagement experience may have been better than the play. For King of the Yees in 2017, which is about Lauren Yee and her embarrassing dad, Larry, we asked audiences to answer these prompts. And I bet everybody can answer these prompts. I know I can. Uh, fun thing about Lauren's dad, Larry, he was kind of an over, over the top figure. We had a talk back at the theater where she invited him to come. He invited every person named Yee in California, I think. And then in the middle of the talk back, identified them all by name and then called them up on stage for a group photo. Uh, and then handed out custom-made fortune cookies for the play. So clearly, he's someone who deserved having a play named after him. So in fall 2017, we did a play called Big Night, which was around the Oscars. And we asked audience members to take a photo of their favorite, of their best gracious loser face. You know, the face you make when someone says, and the winner is, and the camera's on you, and it's not your name, and you've got to go... So... That's the pull, those are the Polaroids of all the people making their best gracious loser face. In 2017, we also did our most successful show, Spamilton. Hot tip, if you want to make a lot of money, do a show with Hamilton on it. Uh, for Spamilton, we had the don't throw away your shot wheel. I don't know if how many of you know Sp Hamilton, but that was a reference to the show. And uh, it, you could basically, the bartender would spin the wheel, whatever shot it landed on, you had to take. And my favorite shot was the Jim Manuel Miranda. We also had Hamilton had Spamilton karaoke every Friday night. Now we called it Hamilton karaoke until we got some feedback from our friends at the Pantages. And so I changed these signs with magic marker. And that was really what this show was like. While we never had a quick draw contest with guns because that's insane, we did for the Black Suits, a rock musical, have an electric guitar in a ticket booth. This, by the way, is probably the coolest looking person who's ever come to the Douglas. Thank God we got it to be photographed. Uh, and that's one of our uh, concierge. He's not an usherette, by the way. We call them concierge, thank you. Uh, Stephen Leidick. But we had the electric guitar. And the goal was, again, as with all these plays, we wanted to get your hands on this to experience what the actors on stage are going through. So when you see them rocking out, you feel it. You know what they've been through. You're part of their journey. We also host post-show uh, post talks where the audience gets to really deconstruct a play among themselves. The actors are not there. Probably the most interesting one of these was after election night 27, 2016, we were doing a play called Vicuña in which a Trump-like character wins, you know, is running for election. And we thought this was satire. Uh, on election night, we realized this was not satire. It was actually a very hard play for us. And that night afterwards, we gathered the audience and spoke about it. It was a very powerful moment. And actually the playwright and the director did join us and the cast. And it became this moment where we all kind of came together and art and life really had this incredible intersection. I hope that never happens again, but it was incredible at that time. In addition to what we've done in the lobby, we've continued to innovate on stage. 
Uh, our most recent program is Block Party, where we invite companies from LA's robust intimate theater scene. I don't know if you guys know this, there are more small theaters in LA than anywhere in the world. It's incredible what happens in LA. People don't think it's a theater town. There are hundreds of theaters. Some of it's terrible, but some of it's actually very good. And we take some of the best and we work with companies to remount their shows at the Douglas. This is an incredibly ambitious program. And as is classic CTG, we started this ambitious program with a show called Failure, a love story. So, you know, Gordon Davidson lives among us still. Kirk Douglas continued to come to the theater for the most of the first years I was there. And he came to see almost everything. In fact, my job was, among other things, to greet him at the rolling gate at the back of the theater, to bring his car in, and to escort him and Mrs. Douglas into the theater and to their seats. He knew everyone on staff. He knew the bartender. She always had a vodka tonic for him. He was really a part of our world. Uh, one story I like to tell is when he, one of the first times I met him, he was speaking to somebody. They took off his sunglasses and he held them out like this. And I had no idea why he did that until I realized, oh, I'm supposed to take those now. When you're a movie star for 70 years and you hold out your sunglasses, somebody takes them. So Kirk Douglas did a one-man show in 2008, 2009. I don't know if anyone saw it. The show was called Before I Forget. He did five performances, 90 minutes each. The man was 93 with a significant speech impairment. He was stroke. He rehearsed twice a week with a speech therapist at the theater who went through the script word by word to make sure he could pronounce all of it. He was a professional, absolute professional. Uh, this was the, the opening of this. I'm going to start to tell another story. was one of the craziest nights of the theater. There were limos out front. There was the city hall parking was unavailable. It was a crazy night. At one point, uh, Kirk Douglas' wife's assistant cut her leg accidentally on the bottom of a stanchion pole that we had borrowed from the Amundsen, which is the last time I ever borrowed anything from the Amundsen. Uh, she didn't want to leave. So my job then became to bandage her leg repeatedly and follow her around with gloves and bandage. And that's how I met Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones. She was introduced to them. I was not actually introduced. I was the guy standing behind her with the bloody gloves and the bandages, <laughs> getting weird looks from Michael D Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Uh, but it was a very odd night, and uh, but the show was was terrific, and he ultimately filmed it. He also came back to the theater to film some pickups of the show a year later, and after he was done doing those, which included a dance number, he finally looked at the director, Jeff Canoe, and said, Jeff, I don't want to be an actor anymore. I think it was finally too much. Um, in 2014, we had the 10th birthday party for the theater, and as you can see, we got this incredible cake shaped like the theater which is one of my favorite things we ever did. And we had marching, we had a marching band come down the aisle. We had the AVPA students perform. By the way, the AVPA is my, like one of my favorite things in Culver City. They do a Java Gala at the theater every year. I, they're the most incredible kids in the world. If you have 200 kids in the building and the worst thing you find one of them doing is holed up in a small room in the dark, cleaning out the spit valve of his tuba, you've got an incredible group of kids. Because let me tell you, that would not have been me at his age. Anyhow. Uh, AVPA performed at this night, and this was bittersweet because it is the last time that Gordon Davidson and Kirk Douglas were ever at the theater together. Gordon passed away on October 2nd, 2016 on Rosh Hashanah with his family. Um, now, Kirk, we didn't know if Kirk was going to speak. He had not been at the theater in about a year. I think the last thing they saw was the rental production of Fifty Shades, the musical, which Anne did not care for. Uh, he had not been to the theater in a while, but sure enough, he grabbed the mic and he spoke for 20 minutes, impromptu, did half his one-man show, told the joke about building his own theater, uh, and killed. And then I had to follow him and introduce the AVPA students. So I did, I got a few laughs, and I was escorting him to his car at the end of the night, and he looked at me and said, Eric, I didn't know you were such a good actor. And I have to tell you, it was the compliment of a lifetime. It was one of the great moments of my career. So this was, we didn't see uh, Mr. Douglas for a while after this. He didn't come back until July, 2019. He was, you know, it was over hundred years old by now. Uh, but on July, 2019, uh, Hugh Jackman and his wife, Deborah Lee Furness, read Kirk and Anne, Letters of Love and Laughter and a Lifetime in Hollywood. It was a special one night fundraiser for CTG and for the TV and Motion Picture Fund. And you know, they hadn't been there for a while. They pulled up in the back. I let them in as I always did. You know, they were older than I remember, but Kirk Douglas is still Kirk Douglas. He is unmistakable. And he was helped into his wheelchair and I knelt by him and I shook his hand and I said, welcome home, Mr. Douglas. 
and he came inside. And we didn't know if he would stoop that night. We had no idea. And then he, and we didn't even know if he'd stay for the whole time, but he stayed for the whole time. And then at the end of the reading, of course, he grabs the mic and he starts talking. He had not, he barely said anything, even to other people. He grabbed the mic and spoke as clear as day to the audience. I mean, as clear as he could. And I think he even told that joke about opening his theater one more time. So we were really glad, we were really honored to have this. We, uh, Kirk Douglas passed away on February 5th, 2020. And on that night, we honored a time old theater tradition, which is that we dimmed the marquee lights for one minute in his honor. So that takes us to February, 2020. And so here we are a couple weeks later, we're loading in a show. We're loading an art couple, which is the first block party show. And I'm sure you know what's gonna come next. These photos were taken on March 11th. And weirdly, we had a photographer at the theater that day taking photos as part of a different project. She'd been following the productions for a while and she just happened to be there that day. So we ended, we don't usually take pictures of people working with a mohawk in the theater. That's Sean, by the way, who has fantastic hair. Uh, we don't usually take pictures of people working in the theater, but she happened to be there and captured this moment. And so, and that was the last time that we were loading in a show. Now, what you might think I'm gonna say is that we've just been sitting there sad and lonely in an empty theater surrounded by dust and ghosts. But that is not the case. That's right. We have been filming at the Douglas. The old movie theater is now the world's tiniest uh, COVID safe film studio. On October 13th, 2020, we welcomed actors back to the stage. And it was for a reading, a filmed reading of Luis Alfaro's play, uh, Oedipus El Rey. Luis Alfaro was a MacArthur Genius Award playwright who wrote a trilogy of Greek tragedy adaptations taking place in Los Angeles. We filmed all three in partnership with the Getty. We then we started a series called Not a Moment, but a Movement, which honors and celebrates black voices. And we filmed Christina Wong's hilarious one person show, Christina Wong for Public Office, which is hysterical. So since then, we have filmed 11 different projects at the Douglas, uh, which by the way, is not something any of us knew how to do a year ago. We are not television people. It's like watching the Muppets seeing us try to figure this out. We've employed over 100 artists. In addition to the staff we've kept employed, we've given paychecks to over 100 artists through this work. And I have personally scheduled over 300 COVID tests. It is not easy producing during COVID. It is exhausting, it is difficult, it is incredibly stressful. And I think Kirk uh, Douglas and Gordon Davidson would be proud of order. So that is all I've got. Thank you so much. Bravo. Makes me want to go back. It, make, it, makes, it makes me want to have all of you back as soon as we can. For anybody who wants to ask Claire or Eric. Um, Eric, I've got a question. Uh, Mark? The uh, one man show that Kirk Douglas did, you said it was filmed. Is that available to see anywhere? Yes. Uh, so he, he did film that and he, it is available for purchase, I think through TCM's website. Oh. Uh, when we filmed it, he didn't actually tell us he was going to distribute it through TCM. Uh, so that was a surprise to us and our friends and actors equity, but he did film it and it is available and it's terrific. Uh, and I think, I believe TCM released it with a box set of his work. I'm not sure how else it's available, mm. but I know they released it along with a box set of other Kirk Douglas theater movies. I was a teenager in the late 60s, early 70s, and my memory is that my mom and I and my sister went to the Culver Theater to see Gone with the Wind when it was reissued. It, it, does that ring a bell with anyone? I, I, I'm trying to figure out if I indeed went to the Culver or if it was a different theater that I went to. I know that uh, around 67 or so, 68, 69, 
was a big restoration of Gone with the Wind. I don't know whether it was shown at the Culver, but that was when the MGM lab did a major restoration of the film. So it was re-released. I'm sorry if I missed that, because that would have been a big deal. And it would make sense because it's that Culver Theater was right next to MGM. So I wouldn't have been surprised if they did. And in 1969, it was 30 years uh, from the making and the release of Gone with the Wind. So it very possibly could have been, you know, just a, a relaunch for a 30 year anniversary. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Ronnie. That was, that was wonderful. And having been to the Cobra Theater, having had Eric show me around there, it is an incredibly special place. And both of you gave that sense of its history and that this is, a, it's a magical building. That's all I can say. Could either one of you, um, Claire or Eric, say something about that incredible tower that says Culver, which that iconic site, what it takes to maintain something like that, that kind of an electrical structure and keep it going and I mean, all these years. I've complained to you about this so many times. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I, I, I can speak for what it takes now. Uh, the, it has approximately 1800 light bulbs each light bulb, we switched from a 40 watt, we switched the light bulbs from a 40 watt light bulb to a cold cathode seven watt bulb. So they maintain the original look of an incandescent bulb, but it's much more power efficient than it used to be. Uh, the neon is all custom. Every piece of neon is custom. Neon is a very specific skill. So we pay a significant amount of money each month to a signage company that maintains it. They're on a retainer. To service the tower, they have to bring a 120 foot crane. They can only service it at night because you can't work on it if you can't see if it's working. And if oh, they come at two o'clock in the morning, maybe I don't have to worry about getting a permit so much. Uh, just don't, don't tell anyone. <laughs> and uh, they're on a service con. They also maintain the marquee. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is constantly in need of work. There is constantly a piece of it out. The wiring was all redone when the theater was opened, but is uh, regularly needs to be upgraded just because pieces go bad. And when it rains, when we get a lot of rain, that wreaks havoc, particularly with the light bulbs because the base is short out. Oh. Mm. And the fiddliest mechanism is the timer that makes it work. So very often when a letter isn't working, it's not because the bulbs are all out, it's because the timer is screwy. Because that, it's kind of like an old player piano. It's actually not digital at all. What controls this tower is a giant switch inside the building that you really flip on. And then there's a timer mechanism uh, up there, which is, I have no idea how to work, uh, but is, is, is a fairly old piece of technology and, is, and requires regular manual adjustments because it flips a series of switches that turn on the cycle. We just, we have the marquee, which I don't have a picture of, but if you've driven by recently, or if you saw that picture from the Kirk Douglas Memorial, you may have noticed that we've switched from the kind of graphic panels to the sort of old channel style lettering. And what inspired us is we filmed Ryan Murphy's show Ratchet. We filmed a scene at the theater where they were coming to see Miracle on 34th Street. And they did that for one night. They switched out all of the marquee panels with these letter panels. They spent a fortune. And we liked the look of that. By the way, that's getting people to film in your theater is a great way to make money if it's not you filming. Uh, but they, um, we liked the look of that so much that we we, can, we converted our whole marquee system to be that. And it's worked out really well because we've had to change messages a lot this year. So yeah, I don't know, Claire, you can speak more to sort of the history of well, it. I just had a question about it. Because I know they said when they built it, they had a television tower. And I don't know if that was the same as the marquee tower, but I don't know how it was a television tower ever or how that would have served a purpose at the time that would have been, had you ever heard of that television tower? No, we have a satellite dish on the roof that I got to watch basketball at the theater. But uh, uh, we, uh, I never heard that till I saw your presentation. I have no idea. That was long gone. All that, no, young, they, all that they wiring, might have They yeah. might have been mimicking the KTLA TV tower in Hollywood just oh. because of its uh, tower kind of a thing. That's maybe what they meant. That would make more yeah, sense. Yeah, kind of a figuratively speaking sort of a deal. Thank you for asking. Thank you. I did do a little research in because the first time I saw Gone with the Wind was at 
Carthay Circle Theater because they had done a um, cinemascope um, version of Gone with the Wind. And then two years later, after the quote, the controversy of having cut up the ratio of the movie, it was shown at the Culver Theater and I saw it for a second time there. But the one comment I, because I've kind of grown up with the Culver Theater and one of the issues that I had was when they reissued um, The Birds about a year after it came out, I must have been about eight years old. My parents allowed me to go by myself and the theater was full on an you know, mid midweek evening pr production. And everyone in my row was like a high school student. And when the first bird showed up, they created such an uproar that the ushers came in and escorted everyone out of the row, except me. Ah. I realized I was not part of that group. So that was my Culver Theater antidote for the evening. That's well, that a fabulous story. That is fantastic. The kid stays in the theater. That's fantastic. <laughs> I recall seeing Gone with the Wind when it was re-released. Re I thought it was at the Grauman's Chinese. I went to with my best friend up there to see it at the Grauman's Chinese, which I thought it might have been Carthay. But um, what we did was we got, also saw the Ten Commandments when it was first re-released in the Culver Theater around 1971. And that was a big deal. We were all excited to see that on the big screen. And as to the movie Tension, I was just so excited last year. I was, I've was i been watching so many more movies because of COVID than I normally watch. I'm turning classic movies. They have a, a um, film noir night um, and uh, noir alley, and they showed Tension. I'd never seen that movie. And there was so many Culver City references. If anybody gets a chance to see it, it was an excellent movie. And uh, there was, a, you know, one of the things you can look for in some of these movies, especially that one, you look for the uh, granite telephone poles that are in Culver City. And you'll see things, you know, throughout the movie, and you'll know they're driving up and down the streets or meeting, you know, oh, that's in Culver City. I'm going to give you a little trivia, being a Culver City kid as well. Um, a few years ago, we did a program about backdrops that we received from the MGM uh, studios uh, through the Art Directors Guild, through Thomas Walsh and Mark, Wan Mark uh, Morris, our media archives uh, department head. And what we found was... Um, doing some research, we were given Viva Las Vegas. And I found a picture of Elvis Presley on the stage inside the Veterans Memorial Building and Anne Margaret doing the go-go dance down below. And it was actually shot there. And then I started talking to some of my mom's friends, class of 54, Culver High, and some of her Hamilton friends. And they were there. They brought in girls, all the girls they could find from Culver City to be extras in the movie at Veterans Memorial Building. So that was kind of fun. And, and the Culver City girls, they loved Elvis, I have to say. Wow, lucky them. Yeah. Uh, I have a question again about the Culver, you know, our Culver City logo, that scripted, wonderful scripted, you know, with the script and the actual Culver sign. And is that in storage somewhere? I'd love to be able to see that come out somewhere. It's such an emblem of Culver City. Where is the Culver, the, you know, the big C-L-U-L-V-E-R? Where is that sign stored? There, there's two of them. And um, I'm going to ask Louise Coffee Webb. Louise, do you want to come up and, and share about that? There you are. She's with our Cultural Affairs Department, and um, she can give us an update. Well, it's apparently going to be incredibly expensive to restore it. So I don't know, again, if they're going to restore it, or if they're going to do a, a totally new reproduction. So um, uh, that's all I know. There is a sign on top of the Culver Steps, and I was under the impression that that is one of the original ones. Yeah, and, that is, and that's what I thought, to be honest. I don't think so. I'm not 100% sure. I thought that was the case as well. But I found it to be much smaller than I remember it being. Ah. Sorry. Um, no, it's not original. There was talk about it. But the one on the Culver Steps is a reproduction. But I think it's wonderful that they they wanted to make it similar. I think they must have had the same uh, realization that was actually less expensive to just build a new one. Um, and the that logo became the official city logo in 2001. Mm -hmm. And it is still part of the city's branding. 
So um, I don't know who actually created that font, but they really, they really need a pat on the back because it's really lived on. <laughs> so the Douglas itself is not owned by Center Theater Group. The city actually owns the Kirk Douglas Theater building and those signs. We have a 100 year lease, oh. uh, 100 year, 70, 70 year lease uh, that we paid 70 bucks for up front. Um, and we, as part of that lease, have to meet certain requirements every year. And I'm really grateful to Carolyn McDemus to give us a piece of the flourish from the side of the front of the stage, which we will now are making space in the museum for it to go on the wall, uh, along with some of the other art pictures that we have from the Culver Theater, giving it a nice place of honor in our, in our museum. But my dad, before he left doing programs for the society, we always wanted to do the speakeasies, the cotton club, the plantation room, the uh, trop tropical inn, a king's tropical inn, all the different speakeasies throughout the city and the music, the jazz, the nightlife, the, you know, during prohibition, all the stuff that was going on. So we really, I'd really love to do that. I wanted to do it more in person um, because I think it would be a great program for that. So. We're always looking for our thoughts and ideas. If you have something specific that you would like to learn more about or see more about or even volunteer, reach out to us at info at culvercity.org and let's, let's do some work together. I think it's um, a good thing.